thank you very much for joining me. I'm the lead paleontologist there and manager of natural science collections. So we are kind of a unique children's museum in that we do have a fully accredited collections that people can use for research and education and exhibitry. Um, and then we have a fully functioning fossil preparation lab that's run by myself. Um, we do our own fossil digs, collect our own fossils, prepare all the fossils there for the public um, and have that experience of one-on-one -on -one with the kiddos. And then of, of the seven oddballs that make up my lab, uh, I, I'm the main oddball and my research specialties are in paleopathologies. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is about how I look at some very old patients who are luckily already dead. So I don't have to worry if I get it wrong. But how do you diagnose something that has been dead for a very long time and is not in any way remotely close to a human? Again, my research studies are mostly in what's called paleopathologies. So the definition of a paleopathology is basically looking at conditions that are found in ancient human or animal remains. So we're talking mostly with skeletal material. If you're someone who studies, you know, like Egyptian mummies, then you can get into some of the soft tissue. But most of paleopathologies focus on the skeleton. Um, so for my case, it's dinosaurs mostly, but I'm not specious, as you'll see through the talk. And I have here two examples, ironically, we're both tyrannosaurids um, that are known for having lots of paleopathologies. Uh, just like in modern animals, it tends to be the carnivores that are having more pathologies with a kind of rough style. So on the bottom there is Sue. She's the famous T-Rex uh, at the Field Museum. And I think she's number three or four for the most pathologies to a single uh, dinosaur individual. So she's got um, muscle avulsions where the muscles ripped off the bone on her arm. She's got broken bones. She's got jaw infections, she's got a whole slew of different injuries. Um, they think that Sue's maybe an older individual. So maybe she's just kind of had a buildup of a rough life. But then on the top there, this is actually a specimen from my museum. This is our Gorgosaurus. Uh, so not a Tyrannosaurus, but a Tyrannosaurid. Um, and we haven't been able to publish anything on this yet, but I will say that our Gorgosaurus is probably fifth or sixth for the most injuries in a single animal. Um, and that includes things like, again, another jaw infection, a muscle avulsion on the femur. So again, where this muscle is ripping right off of the femur, um, some really strange growth going on right in her shoulder to make it difficult to move. So some of these, these dinosaurs and these individuals I look at are just full of these different injuries. And what I like about looking at paleopathologies, especially for things like dinosaurs, where we're so used to just seeing them as skeletons, is that when you see these injuries and diseases, you remember, oh yes, these were living animals, right? They, they walked around, they had bad days, just like the rest of us. You know, if anybody's broken a bone, you can be like, oh yeah, I remember that. That was not fun. You can think about how that would have affected the dinosaur. So it really helps bring the dinosaurs to life and also helps people see them as individuals. So here's some of the, the extremes of pathologies that I've seen in my travels. Um, any, anywhere you see, like basically looks like cauliflower, that shouldn't be there. So I have some examples here of some broken and fused uh, tailbone from a sauropod. Um, I have broken and fused uh, toes from a um, little ornithischian, probably a Camptosaurus. Um, so think like a ductile dinosaur, but smaller. Um, this on the bottom right there is a humor. So the upper arm bone from a ductile dinosaur, and they're supposed to be hatchet shaped. And you can see that this one is instead looks more like a big box because of the growth. And then on the bottom left, there, this is actually a mammal. And there's a, there's a bone stuck on the tooth of this jaw. So it literally bit off more than it could chew. <laughs> And it's just kind of stuck there. So these are just some examples that I've seen throughout my travels of animals who had very, very bad days. So I'm often asked, like, how do you identify that something is a pathology? You know, how do you know that that's, that's something that's wrong with the animal? And actually, the first thing you do is something that we as humans are very good at. And that's seeing if there's something that looks odd. What doesn't look right to us? Um, you know, so this is an example on left here of a seal. Um, and what you're seeing is the, the humerus, the ulna and the radius. So you're looking at the elbow joint. You can see all of that very frothy looking bone. 
And even if you do nothing about diseases or anything, you you probably go and, you know, I don't think my elbow joint should look like that. That seems like that would not be a good idea. Um, and then on the on the uh, right there is a vertebra with a little button in it. Um, that's from a duck-bill dinosaur. And again, you might not know anything about diseases, but you should also kind of be like, okay, if if I was a duck dinosaur, I wouldn't want this little button of bone growing into my, my vertebral disc. That sounds like an ouch to me. So the first thing you really do is just, again, is there anything that looks odd? Um, now, sometimes animals are just odd. So the next thing to do is to look for symmetry because chances are if it's going to be some kind of pathology, an injury, a disease, an infection, whatever, it's going to be asymmetrical. It's not going to be the same on both unless they happen to break both bones at the same time. So I have examples up here. The skull is from a rabbit and rabbits have this very honeycomb look to their skull that if you didn't know anything about rabbits and you only saw the one side, you might think is something that's wrong with it. It looks like the bones be eaten away. When in fact, this is perfectly normal for rabbits and it just lightens up their skull. And we know that because we can look at a bunch of different rabbits and see they all have it. And we can see that it's symmetrical in the skull, always in the same location. Versus the picture of the limb bones there, where you can see there's one that looks like a nice straight spatula, and there's another one that's shorter and has all this kind of rough texture to it. And this is um, and a bird, and we have one of the humerus, so one of the upper arm bones that is fine, and the other one that was broken and slid down, and then the bird tried to heal it, and it didn't quite work. Then when I'm looking at stuff, the next question I have is, reptile versus bird versus mammal. So when you're going to the doctor, you know, chances are the doctor is going to compare you to other humans or at least other mammals. You know, we, between reptiles, birds, and mammals, we have different kinds of physiology. So speed at which we grow, the different conditions that we are more prone to based on our immunity, you know, what, what is our skeleton like? So if this example I have up here is an indigo snake. So if you're a snake, chances are you're going to have some vertebral issues because that's mostly what you are. Um, but again, if you're a reptile versus a bird versus a mammal, there's going to be different ways you react to different conditions. There might be some conditions that you're more prone to than others. Um, so for instance, you know, we as humans, we have a long lifespan. So it is more likely that we will have something like a cancer than wild individuals who typically don't live that long. Uh, so this is just an example. We have the snake on the one side and then the other side is an ostrich is two neck bones, two cervicals from an ostrich. And they both have this kind of melty candle wax look of, of fusion of the verts. But is this the same condition or is it something different? You know, it's in different sections of the vertebral column and it's in two very different types of animals. It could be two different kinds of conditions. This is something, again, a similar look to it, but this is in a polar bear. So and this is in the back series. So again, we have this, this very similar candle wax looking growth. We know there's fusion kind of going on with the verts. We know that it's not okay. Like, you know, your verts shouldn't look like they've been melted, but are these all the same kind of conditions? Are they different kinds of conditions? And that's where you, you can have even difficulty with modern animals trying to tell apart. And then of course, my biggest thing is, well, then what do I compare it to for a dinosaur? Because dinosaurs are birds. It's a thing. Don't let anybody tell you different. They are birds. Birds are dinosaurs, I should actually say. So they're a branch of dinosaurs. But the problem is, okay, this was a slow process and there's a whole, you know, diversity of dinosaurs. There are dinosaurs that, you know, are seeing birds fly around them. Birds were around when dinosaurs were around. They're just a, a subset of dinosaurs. So when I'm looking at this dinosaur, is it, how, does it have a physiology that's more like a crocodile, some more of that kind of ancestral physiology, or is it more like a, a bird's physiology? Is it something in the middle? So that adds an extra layer of complication. So this example of the melty candle wax fusion inverts is from Stan the Tyrannosaurus. So again, if we looked back at our, our snake or our ostrich and our polar bear, you know, it's probably going to be more ostrich than it is snake, but Again, where, where do I draw that line? And can I even be the one to draw that line? So it adds a whole level of complexity when you're trying to diagnose these critters. The other problem is, again, it's just bones. So if you go to the doctor with pain, right, 
and you want to know, hey, doctor, you know, what do I have? They're probably going to do more than one test, or at least you hope your doctor does more than one test, unless you come in with a stab wound, in which case you're like, okay, you've been stabbed, you need to have this. But for example, in Patchett's disease, these are the different things that they would do to test if you had Patchett's disease. And, you know, you'd go back for retesting as you're healing and everything to make sure that things were okay. But I, of course, only have the bones. So for some of these conditions, I can limit, eliminate certain things that I know it's not. But, you know, I will f- never know if, for instance, it's, if it is a cancer, if it's one of these hundred different types of cancer. I just know that it's a type that affects the bone. And there are different ways to kind of differentiate that a bit, but you will never be hundred percent sure. Um, so if you ever see anything on paleopathology, um, that they're like, it was 100% this always question it, unless it again is a very obvious thing. Like they x-rayed it and there's a T-Rex tooth embedded into the vertebra and they're like, okay, it was bitten. You know, that one was kind of obvious. Uh, so when I'm looking at pathologies, I try to use a bunch of different techniques. Cause again, I am limited to the skeleton, but the skeleton can tell you quite a lot about an animal. So for instance, um, there's two really cool things about bone. One is that your, your bone mineral structure can incorporate half the periodic table into that mineral structure. Um, so your bones are a sink for all and release for all the different essential elements that you need throughout your life. And this is why your skeleton is always being remodeled. Um, so you, you store stuff in there when you don't need it and you get it when you do. Um, so that's one cool thing about bone. And the other cool thing about bone is the only tissue type that doesn't form a scar tissue. So bone heals, it actually goes through the same processes it does when it was developing. So it's it, when you're looking at a healing bone in an animal, you can kind of get an idea about their physiology based on how it's healing, which is kind of cool. Uh, So one of the techniques that I use that uh, has become kind of a big thing in paleontology since I'd say maybe the the mid to late 90s is paleohistology. So basically cutting the bone and polishing it super thin so you can look under a microscope. And I have two examples here. I have on the top is a uh, secretary bird. So the toe cross section should just look like a circle and you can see that it's got these nice Fairly lacy looking bits of growth. This particular individual, the toe was so badly infected, you can barely see the outline of the toe on the outside. It just looked like a mass. Um, and then you'll see this critter again. This, this is my love-hate relationship with it, the dinosaur Allosaurus. Uh, but here we have a transverse section going through an Allosaurus toe. Um, and there's a bump here that's uh, a fracture callus. So it would, had broken its toe and it was starting to heal. Um, so we look at the, these bones under the microscope. These are kind of pulled back, but you can look closer in and you can see the degree of healing. You can see how fast these animals were growing. You can see all different kinds of things with the histology. Um, the problem with histology is one, you have to convince people to let you cut things, um, which being someone who manages a collection, I get, you know, your, your main job as a curator is to, to protect these specimens for future analyses. Um, But the other issue is that, of course, your bone is changing depending on where you slice. So this is an example um, of a uh, a Cetacosaurus. So those are the weird, small, not so horned dinosaur from uh, Mongolia and China. Um, And it has this fracture, but depending on where my colleague cut it, you see a different part of the fracture. So he was very lucky in that he was able to serial slice so he could cut into a bunch of different places, but usually the curator, you're lucky if you cut in one spot. So the problem with histology is you get very nice detail. So you can really see down to very fine structures, but you're only seeing a very small snapshot. It would, you know, it's like that single x-ray, but you're only seeing it in a little small area. Um, The other problem with histology is some tissue types look very similar. So on the left, the kind of reddish picture, this is the inside of the allosaurus, the fracture, and this kind of weird bone that looks like a bit like someone let their Cheerio soak in the milk too long. Um, That is just being called medullary tissue because it's just in the medullary cavity, but it looks like it's associated with the break in this, this allosaurus toe. The more faded picture on the right has that similar texture, but this is from a bird that was about to lay an egg. So this is that medullary bone 
used for laying eggs. They look very similar histologically. So, you know, if it's a modern animal and you have all the notes on it and you know that, yes, when it died, it was about to lay eggs and you could eliminate this, but it's almost impossible for dinosaurs. Um, I'm currently working on a project with some people from North Carolina trying to figure out how, if you can do this in a different way than just looking at the histology, because we, we don't really understand this tissue type. If it plays, so we have some newer technology. This is a CT scan, just a medical CT scan of Sue's humerus. So that's the one with the muscle avulsion. Um, and I'll see if it'll let me play it again. Because so what I want you to notice is that you can see inside, but it's not the best, right? It's very washed out. It's kind of fuzzy. So it's not the best. Um, and here's, here's a medical scanner that I got to use at the University of Pennsylvania at their equestrian place. This was awesome. It's basically, it's a scanner. The two large arms that you see are the scanner and the detector, and they, they move in sequence. And the woman standing there on the left is controlling it with a joystick. And the idea with this scanner is that you can scan horses while they're still standing up. So, you you know, because horses, they can injure real easily if you have to put them to sleep while you're trying to scan them. Um, and we were trying to use it to look at a fossil turtle because it's a bit too big to fit into a medical scanner. And if you look at the, the computer screen there on the right, the issue is that, again, you're not seeing much. And that's because medical scanners aren't really meant to scan fossil. So here's an example of our, of our Gorgosaurus that I had introduced to you in the beginning of its scapula coracoid, so the shoulder girdle elements. And again, this is done in a, a medical scanner. Medical scanners aren't meant to kill you. That would defeat the purpose. So they tend to be lower energy because all they have to get through is your soft tissue and your modern bone. With these fossils, they're fossilized. So some of them, you know, some things like mastodon bones and such, which haven't become fully fossilized or ones that are in a software, uh, what we call the matrix of surrounding rock, you might be able to use these. But for a lot of the dinosaur fossils, these are solid. There's lots of iron and manganese and really heavy elements in here that these scanners just can't penetrate through because they're not meant to do that. They're again, meant to scan living things or recently dead things that aren't that dense. So for that, we turn to the engineers. Thank you, engineers. Those who use similar techniques, just a lot stronger to look at things like concrete because they're interested in, you know, micro fractures at a rad waste facility kind of thing. So we always joke that we're the cool ones because they're not scanning engine parts and concrete, they're scanning dinosaur bones. So it's the same kind of idea as your medical scanner, but usually we do a much finer scale. So we use micro CT and it's a much higher energy. Um, so this is an example of successfully using that. This is from a Hadrosaurus from New Jersey. Um, and you're looking at uh, the ulna, um, which kind of looked like, if you remember that seal picture, yeah, it kind of looked like that. So the, the whole elbow area of the joint um, was almost completely eaten away. The radius looks the same. Um, and by, by using this technique, I'm able, again, to look at the inside and look at multiple layers because what I was trying to figure out is if it was an infection called osteomyelitis or septic arthritis. And the main difference between those two is one tends to you have an open wound and the infection comes from the inside. The other one tends to be that you get arthritis. Basically, the infection starts from the inside. It works its way out. Um, so you have to look at the, the structure of the bone for that. And from this, it looked like it was more of a septic arthritis condition. So successfully using the micro CT scan to look at this hadrosaur from New Jersey. Again, we didn't want to cut it because dinosaur material is very rare from New Jersey. Um, this material is also very fragile because they tend to be found in waterlogged areas. So the bones tend to get kind of crumbly. Um, so you don't want to try to cut it. In fact, when I was moving this around to take pictures, little pieces were were kind of dripping off and I was a bit nervous. Um, so the micro CT allowed us to successfully diagnose it without having to do any kind of what we'd call destructive analysis. So to not cut it or break it or do anything like that. Um, this is another example. This is from an Edmontosaurus, so another duckbill dinosaur. Um, and here we have a severely broken toe that now makes it look like a boomerang. And in fact, when we CT scanned it, if you look in the section D there, there's actually two toes involved. So 
it really broke it and part of the toe got actually fused to the other main toe. So this, this, and Montesaurus was not happy. Um, and just again, to prove that I'm not specious, um, I've used this on a variety of different vertebrates and everything from modern to, I guess my oldest patient so far is 150 million years old. Um, I don't do fish though, they're weird. But this is an example of us using this similar technique on a hognose badger from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Um, and you can see the picture of it. It already doesn't look quite right, uh, but um, the jaw is actually protruding out. It's got what you know you would call like that very Neanderthal look, the very you know raised eyebrows and everything, and uh, very dense bone. So using the CT scan from this individual and using um, CT scans from a normal individual that I found on Morphospace, thank you, University of Austin, uh, we were able to diagnose that this individual has what's called acromegaly, which is a kind of development disease involving the pituitary. Um, and it's actually the first sign of this condition outside of cats, dogs, and people that hasn't been purposely induced in, in an individual. So um, that was pretty cool. And it was also neat because uh, with this individual, we got to have a whole, a whole kind of um, sleuthing. We got to actually contact, it was a, a former Philadelphia Zoo specimen. So we got to contact their vet and he had to go through the notes and see what the other conditions were facing with this individual. Um, because, you know, surprise, surprise, there's not a lot of literature on diseases and conditions in a hognose badger. Just apparently nobody's doing it. No one has love for the hognose badger. So those are what I've been using to kind of look at the morphology. So just the internal structure of these different conditions. The kind of newest and most sci-fi sounding of, of the instruments that I use is the synchrotron, um, which I should say right away that the synchrotron is the machine. The technique that I use, I'll explain a little bit, is called XRF. Um, but synchrotrons are basically, you know, People can know of particle accelerators, but basically you have a, a constant state of energy that's very high and very tunable. So on this diagram I have where you see a beam line, each of those beam lines can fine tweak an experiment to whatever they need. So that means multiple experiments can be going at the same time, but all with their own custom set of parameters. It also means that I can scan one thing at one beam line. And then if I want to see something different about it, I can go to another beam line so I can get a whole slew of different analyses done. And again, because it's very tunable, then I can do some very uh, finicky experiments that wouldn't be possible with some other equipment. So I've used two different um, synchrotrons. I'm still using this one here at Stanford. This is the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source in Palo Alto. Um, it's kind of a fun place in that it's one of the oldest still running synchrotrons in the world. So you get to see where some of the things are just held together with aluminum foil and hopes and dreams. Um, but there's, you meet a whole bunch of really interesting people. Cause again, this, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of experiments. So we, I think the last time I was there in person, we ran into somebody who was looking at the chemistry of glues that marine animals use to attach themselves to rock as a way to figure out how to make glues for boats that are waterproof. So it's those kind of experiments that are going on at these facilities. Um, this is one of the, the hutches or ex this is where we're doing the experiments. Um, you can see there, that's the Berlin Archaeopteryx. So one of the cool things about this setup is we're looking at chemistry. And usually when you're looking at the chemistry of these things, you either have to take a sample and dissolve it, or you're only allowed to look at about a postage size stamp of a sample. We can, we can scan a meter by a meter. So we were able to scan this entire Archaeopteryx specimen, um, which you'll see in a bit why that's so important. Uh, we're also able, you'll notice this one looks like it's in a bit of a picture frame. We can also put it in um, helium to try to eliminate some of the scatter we get from the air when we're looking at some of the lower energy elements. So the guys that are lighter on that periodic table, I must admit, I'm not into those. I'm a heavy element kind of gal, uh, but it is an option that we have at these beam lines. The other one that looks a bit more like the Enterprise is a newer synchrotron, and this one's in... Oxfordshire in the UK. So right outside of Oxford, this is the diamond light source. Um, here's my lovely Dutch calling Arjen van Velen for scale. Uh, and you'll notice it's a very large hutch, but his phone is what's limiting the sample. So at this particular 
Beamline, um, we are limited to what size we can scan. Uh, so this is where I might scan, like if I've already made a section of a rib, this is where I might scan that particular sample. Okay, so what, what is XRF? I kind of mentioned it before. So XRF stands for X-ray fluorescence. Um, and it's one of the chemical techs we, we use to basically fingerprint, so, I, so identify what element we're looking at and to map it. So if you could think of, we're putting on a filter on a camera so that the camera is only showing you an image of a specific element on the periodic table at a time. That's what we're doing. So what happens is if you're calling following this through steps one through four there, we're hitting our sample with a known energy. Because again, this is a very tunable source. Hit the sample the energy, it hits those, those different atoms in our sample and it starts exciting those electrons there. If it excites it enough, and hopefully for us, we would like it to be a K shell, those are the most diagnostic, it'll actually eject an electron out of there. So that's kind of step two. Atoms don't really like their shells to have electrons jetted out, it makes them unstable. So what you get is this kind of cascade effect where a, a electron from a higher up shell will drop down to fill in that hole, so that's step three. And when this happens, it releases what's called a secondary or a fluorescent X-ray. So that's how this technique gets its name because it's that that we're measuring, that, that secondary or that fluorescent X-ray. And each element on the periodic table has its own unique fluorescent X-ray energy. So that's how we're fingerprinting. And then again, what the software does is we say, right, I want to see this, this fossil, but I want to see it only in the lens of the energy that is iron, right? And you put that on and then you just see how iron is across the sample. Now I wanna see calcium, so you just calcium. Um, so again, we'll, to do this, what we do is we raster, we go back and forth, that red line there is our beam line, it's hitting our sample as we go back and forth. And every time it hits that, we're having all those fluorescent x-rays just coming on off. Those go into a detector and the detector is what's picking up, okay, how many of those instances do we have, which we can use to do quantification and what type is it? So, you know, it's not gonna just say, I'm only looking at iron. It's looking at all the stuff that's coming up and saying, okay, across this sample, you have these elements. So this is an example of what you can get. Um, my research group is very soft tissue heavy. Uh, I am not, so you'll see a little bit of diversity here. Uh, my personal favorite is our what we jokingly call our CSI leaf. So that's a green river leaf there, and it looks like it says CSI, uh, but that actually is um, feeding traces from caterpillars and a zoomed in area there. You can actually see the frass, so the caterpillar poop from it. And what we're showing you in false colors, you can see that the leaf has a different chemistry than the surrounding rock. That's very important for us when we're trying to say this is original chemistry versus something that might be coming in diagenetically. So something that's coming in while it's getting fossilized. Um, the colorful, like blue and red and green picture there of the bird, that's Confucius Ornus. That's the oldest known bird with a beak. And with that, what we're showing is we were able to show distinct chemistry between the feathers that actually were helped us to tell the color of the animal. And then you see the difference in the chemistry of the bones and then the surrounding rock again. Um, we've done something similar. The, the kind of bluish and yellow bird is a green river bird. And then the single feather there, that's actually the type specimen of Archaeopteryx, which is a single feather. So again, I think bones are cooler though. So I tend to use these same techniques and look at bone chemistry. This is a lovely image of um, a sauropod, probably a scapula. Um, and it's showing you how the, the infill minerals are different from the bone tissue uh, minerals. So when I'm looking at these bones and I wanna look at original chemistry, there's kind of three main players that I'm interested in. Um, so the first is copper, and that's really important for your collagen. So the squishy, rubbery bit part of your bone. Um, and it's important for keeping crosslinks, so making sure that doesn't unravel. Zinc, which I nerdingly will say is my favorite element, is extremely important in a lot of different processes for bone repair and maintenance. And that's because it helps stimulate bone, form, bone formation in areas where there's ossification. So at your growth plates, um, where your osteon, so these things when you're remodeling, when your bone's eating away and then putting it back, um, when you're forming a catalyst to heal a fracture, those are all important things for zinc. And then strontium helps increase bone deposition. So you may have heard there's a, a drug called strontium renolate that some people will take if they have osteoporosis. So here's our allosaurus. I told you he'd be back. So again, here's our, our fracture callus. 
we've got that weird cavity with the funky melty Cheerio bone. And then we actually have a second callus down there. So this is what it looks like in the histology. This is what it looks like just in the element phosphorus. So what you'll already notice is that it has completely gotten rid of all the mineral infill. And that's because that's a calcite infill. So now you're just seeing the bone tissue. So now you can see some more details in the callus. You can see direction that the bone's going. So for instance, we see some little cavities here. You can definitely see that, that melty tissue there in the inside. And you can kind of see the little callus a little easier. This is in iron. So this is more of a diagenetic, more of a, a fossil kind of print here, but it's really helping pop out those details of those two fractures. Um, so even, even the chemistry is helping me look at kind of the histology. And if I zoom in, so again, we have the histology on the top and we have the chemistry on the bottom. And if you look at the iron, you'll notice if you look right where that bright white part is, that's the callus where it meets that dark black part, which is the fossil. You so see these lines that you don't see in the histology, and that's actually showing where the fracture is remodeling. So where it's going from being a fracture to normal bone. And that's very important for helping us tell the stage of fracture healing and how it's going about fracture healing. And then if we zoom in even more, so we've got our histology, and then we have strontium and we have zinc. Um, and the, the Callus is on the top. So again, that kind of melty Cheerio look and the normal bone is looks more like planks of wood. But if I draw a line just to really separate them, um, what you'll notice is, you know, the strontium. Okay. It shows that you can really see that the difference in the tissue types, but the big interesting thing from my point is that if you look at the zinc, there is more zinc in the fracture callus and zinc is again important for areas of ossification like this fracture callus. So is this the sign that we have original chemistry of fracture healing in a dinosaur? Now, of course, I have to mind my P's and Q's, and the fracture is also more porous tissue. So this is an area that could be maybe more altered during fossilization. Um, so the next thing I should check is, okay, what are the concentrations and compare those to modern animals? And also, how is the zinc? How is it actually in the bone tissue? So how, what is it linked to? Is it linked to an appetite that's very similar to bone or is it more linked to an element like the calcite that's coming in during fossilization? So I promise this is important. It looks like just some random squiggly lines, but this is um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So this is what we're basically seeing is how those elements are in that fossil. So is it in a appetite structure in bone? Is it in a calcite structure, the diagenic infill? Is it linked to iron, which is more likely to cause fossilization? And we look at the, those spectra to tell us that and compare it to modern animals. And for my Allosaurus, it is much more similar to modern bone than any form of diagenesis. So for this paper, we were able to prove that we have preservation of original fracture callus healing preserved in something that's 150 million years old, which is Pretty darn cool. So that's just kind of where I've been and where I'm going. Again, just to prove that I'm I'm not specious. I'm all over the place. Um, the whale skull there is actually upside down, which makes it a bit confusing. But there's a big cauliflower growth there on the right hand side. So this is a a whale from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia that I'm working on with some colleagues to try to diagnose. Um, I'm going to be revisiting our Gorgosaurus at the Children's Museum. Uh, we've got a couple new findings that have been interesting, especially since we've had to take the whole skeleton down due to uh, we're doing some refurb in our galleries. Uh, the That one random little vert there is from an Amontosaurus, and you'll notice it looks like it's smiling at you. I have showed this image and the CT scans that go with it to people all over the world, including the Royal Veterinary College, and nobody knows what it is. So we're trying to figure out what this condition is and what's going on with duckbill dinosaurs. Um, and then, of course, finding new things as we're going through our collections at the Children's Museum. So with that, I'm going to thank all the, the institutions who, who grace me with their specimens and all the ones that let me zap things at their facilities. And I, I am ready for some questions, Jim. I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Um, would you say that pathologies are more common th than not? in things that you've looked at? So looking at the different collections, it's not that they're they're more common. 
Um, they still are fairly rare because, you know, it, it also depends on how intrusive it is. So if you're an animal that that thing's going to kill you pretty darn quick, I won't see evidence in the skeleton. Um, so that's one thing that, you know, is to note whenever people say, did that pathology kill the animal? I say, well, it's ha it had to live long enough for it to heal. You know, it probably didn't help. What I will say is that there are many collections both for extant animals, so your, your mammalogy, your herpetology, your, your ornithology collections, and for fossil individuals that do a very poor job of recording their pathologies. Um, so I've even just gone through collections, just making note of all the just instances of, hey, this has some form of pathology to give to the curators, um, because they often get overlooked on, on papers. It's just kind of a quick note. Um, so I would say they're they're not very common, but they're more common than what is noted in kind of the, the everyday literature. And the use of a synchrotron, mm -hmm. is there, like how far ahead do you have to plan? How much demand is there for everybody to get their time on the machine? Uh, with the synchrotron, one, it depends which synchrotron you use, but it also depends which technique you want to use because different ones have a different uh, supply and demand. Uh, but it, the synchrotron, the way to use it, because all the synchrotrons are government facilities. So actually the one in Stanford, for instance, is run by the Department of Energy. Um, so what you do is you apply like you would a grant. So you, they, every year, I think it's three times a year, you can put in a proposal and, you know, just like a grant, you put, this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going to do it. These, you know, I have done my research and, and your, your facilities are what are going to tell me the answers and see this is me doing my research. So you send in that proposal. And again, just like a grant, they bring outside people to review. They review your proposals. And depending on um, what grade you get on your proposal is whether or not you get time at the synchrotron, as well as if you do get time, how much time you get. With, with COVID, it's been very interesting because, of course, they had to shut down for a while. So they were giving presents to people who were doing COVID research at the synchrotrons. Um, so I my one proposal I'm on now, we submitted in 2019, but we didn't get to actually scan anything until the end of 2020. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the synchrotron, depends which technique you want to use. And it also depends on world issues like COVID. All right. So uh, I'm afraid I have to bring you to a close for today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. You can register for next week's talk at smb.org. Each talk is free to attend and is open to the first 300 registrants. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next week, stay safe and stay curious. <music>